I think we're ready to kick it off. Good evening and good afternoon to those of you uh, still on the West Coast and welcome. Before we begin today's session, even though we are again meeting virtually, we are all currently sitting or standing on what is indigenous territory. And with the permission of the Karina Gold and Ohlone leader, I would like to acknowledge that Turo University, California sits on the traditional territory of the Karkin Ohlone who lovingly stewarded this land for generations. On this day, we also want to acknowledge and appreciate our veterans for their public service and recognize the unique public health needs and mental health challenges that many suffer from as a result of military exposure, domestic and abroad. This evening marks the final session of this year's annual Turo University California Social Justice and Public Health Speaker Series hosted by the Public Health Program. My name is Gail Cummings and I am the Program Director for the Public Health Program here at Turo University California. I am joined by Professor Deirdre Wilson, Co-Coordinator of the Social Justice and Public Health course and moderator for today's session. The topic of this year's series, for those of you who are new, has focused on the mental health and well being and the complex intersections between COVID 19, the pandemic, struct structural racism, and inequities in mental health through a public health lens. From the former US Surgeon General to our local activists and researchers, over the past six sessions, we have examined the root causes, implications, opportunities, and solutions of these competing public health crises. We are so excited today to welcome back Dr. Ruben Miller, who will help us wrap up our series with his talk on the criminalization of mental illness. Some of you may remember Dr. Miller, who has been an integral voice of our series for the last couple of years. We are so privileged to welcome him back on the heels of his most recent book, Halfway Home. But before we bring him on, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Deirdre Wilson, Chair of the Community Health for Action Concentration. Good evening, everyone, and thank you once again for participating in our seventh annual Social Justice Speaker Series. Uh, this is our sixth and final session for this year's uh, series, and we are quite excited to welcome Dr. Miller. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a bit of housekeeping. Of course, this is a course for our students, and... Oh, let me make sure I get to the right slide. Give me a moment. Uh, and what we need to do is make sure that you all are properly going uh, through the, the uh, sessions and also making sure that you uh, complete the assignments that are required. So if you haven't checked your, your uh, announcements, please do so. Just as a reminder, uh, there is a Zoom recording policy. This session is being recorded, uh, so please keep that in mind. We will have a discussion concluding Dr. Miller's uh, presentation uh, that will be moderated by me and uh, Dr. Cummings will uh, ask Dr. Miller several series of questions and then we will open up to have a brief Q&A session uh, with our students and participants. If you are interested in continuing medical education or continuing education, please log on to the appropriate site. If you're interested in con uh, continuing uh, public health uh, education, if you have the CPH, please log on to uh, the Toro uh, CPH through the uh, Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. If you're interested in continuing medical education, uh, we're offering credits through our College of Osteopathic Medicine. Here is the login for the CME, and it is also in the chat. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Miller. If you would give me a moment to do that. Dr. Miller has not only participated in our social justice speaker series multiple times throughout um, our years, he's also inspired us in many ways. 
And I'd like to acknowledge his inspiration and uh, assistance in helping us to develop our criminal justice speaker uh, criminal justice uh, uh, track for public health, one of the first in this country. Uh, but besides that, we were first introduced through uh, to Dr. Miller through his work uh, in criminal justice uh, prior to him publishing his book, Halfway Home, uh, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration. Dr. Miller is an associate professor in, uh, in the University of Chicago's Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy, and Practice, and his research examines the life at the intersections of race, poverty, crime control, and social welfare, welfare policy. His first book, as I previously mentioned, Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration, is based on 15 years of research and practice with currently and firm, uh, formerly incarcerated men and women, their families, partners, and friends. Dr. Miller has conducted fieldwork in Chicago, Detroit, and New York City, examining how law, policy, and emergent practices of state and third party supervision change the contours of citizenship, activism, community, and family life for poor Black Americans and the urban poor broadly. They captured the effects of crime control on social life in global cities with different public policies. Dr. Miller conducts ongoing fieldwork in Glasgow, London, and Belgrade. He is currently conducting research on the moral worlds of people we've deemed violent and will launch a comparative study of punishment and social welfare policy in the port cities that were most involved in the transatlantic slave trade. Prior to joining Crown Family School, Dr. Miller was an assistant professor of social work at the University of Michigan, where he served as faculty associate in the Population Studies Center and a faculty affiliate in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies. He was selected as a member of the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, the world's leading center for curiosity-driven research, a visiting fellow at Dartmouth University, and an Eric and Wendy Schmidt National Fellow at the New American Foundation. His work has been published in journals of crim uh, criminology, human rights, law, psychology, sociology, social work, and public health. And he is frequently called upon to give media commentary on issues of crime, punishment, race, and poverty. A native son of Chicago's South Side, Dr. Miller received his PhD from Loyola University, Chicago, and his master's degree Oh, I'm sorry, an AM from the University of Chicago and bachelor's degree from Chicago State University. Dr. Miller, we welcome you once again and we, we are so honored to have you wrap up our series to pull all of the pieces together from the previous speakers. So once again, let's welcome Dr. Miller. Thank you, thank you so much. So, so Professor Wilson, thank you, thank you so much. I, 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 I just really feel blessed. Uh, you know, you, you reached out to me years ago, and 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 uh, and 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 we've connected and stayed connected, and this has been wonderful. And Professor Cummings, uh, since since meeting you, and and of course uh, Professor Kelly and um, Charlene, just you all are wonderful hosts and good friends, and and just I'm I'm just grateful uh, to do this. Um, and so anyway, I wanna I wanna just jump right into uh, our our discussion today. I'd like to uh, share my screen, uh, and. Uh, I want to jump right into our discussion, um, which is really about the criminalization of, 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 of mental illness. Um, and I want to talk about some things that we know well and perhaps some things that we maybe don't pay enough attention to. And so, and so because this is a school of public health, because you do uh, the important work, because the spotlight has been on health professionals of all kinds, especially uh, folks in public health, and in medicine uh, in this global pandemic. Because your jobs are so important, I wanna remind us of people who are easy to forget about, um, people we've learned to overlook, people we've learned to throw away. This is certainly the mentally ill. This is certainly people that we incarcerate 
and, and lock away in our jails and prisons. Uh, uh, but I wanna talk today about the relationship between those, those two things. So first I wanna start by laying out the contours of mass incarceration and things that we all know uh, or many of us know. Um, we know, for example, that there's something like 2 million people in an American jail or prison right now. That's on any given day. Uh, we know that the incarceration rate has increased each year for 27 straight years beginning in 1972 when we arrested or incarcerated just about 300,000 people uh, each year. We were on track with the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian countries that we look toward, uh, with Western European countries that we think have uh, the kinds of incarceration rates that we'd like. In fact, we were something of a leader uh, in, in, in not incarcerating so many people. And we believe deeply, at least rhetorically, uh, in, in, in the rehabilitative ideal. Um, but we changed gears in the 1970s and we started arresting more and more people. This was on the wave of the civil rights movement. This was a moment when we decided that uh, the plight of Black Americans was something we had less patience for. And the prison began to blacken. It shifted from something like two thirds white to something like two thirds non-white over the course of the next 20 or so years. But anyway, this is the beginning of mass incarceration. And of course the mass means the targeted incarceration of social groups, so much so that we arrest entire groups rather than thinking about this as just individuals. And the group in this case uh, are, 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 are poor black men. And we know something about the stats for black Americans specifically, that black people are twice as likely to be incarcerated, they, they're five times more likely, I'm sorry, twice likely to be arrested, five times more likely to be incarcerated. Uh, uh, this includes 60% of people who drop out of high school, black American men who drop out of high school will be arrested over their life course, and something like 30% of those are who graduate. In addition to this, we know that black people in this country do more time. Their sentences are 10% longer on average in state facilities, 20% longer in federal facilities. This is uh, uh, for the same crimes committed by their white counterparts. But it's important for us to remember that mass incarceration doesn't stop at the threshold of the black family. It's not just black people who are arrested and incarcerated in this country. There's nearly a million white people, at least 800,000, right now in an American jail or prison. One in two American families right now has a loved one who's locked away in an American jail or prison, including one in eight white women. But the people who we overwhelmingly incarcerate, more so than, than any racial group, is really the poor, the poor of all groups. Uh, so, so recent statistics tell us that something like 57% of the men and 72% of the women who are in prison today report living below the poverty line. We punish the poor. We punish the disadvantaged. Up to 80% qualify as indigent for the purposes of legal defense, meaning they report being too poor to be able to afford their own counsel. So they have to work with a public defender. That's 80% of the prison population. But there are other problems too that we know about and that we've known about for literally decades. For example, HIV prevalence in prisons. When we say we punish the poor and the disadvantaged, we also punish the sick. HIV prevalence is five times higher in prisons than it is in the general population. Hepatitis C, up to nine times higher, depending on the year that the study was done. Between 12 and 35% of all people uh, with communicable diseases passed through a prison in the year before the communicable disease was reported in the general population. We knew all of this before COVID-19. We knew all of this before, we knew that the prison is a test tube, it's an incubator for chronic illnesses and communicable diseases. And we also know that the population is vulnerable. The prison population is rapidly aging. We knew this before COVID-19, yet we didn't act. As a result, of course, prisons became a hotspot. But that's not the focus of the conversation today. What I wanna talk about today is another health problem that I think flies under the radar. This is the problem of mental health. And I wanna suggest that mass incarceration is in fact the cause of something like a mental health crisis. 20% of the jail and 15% of the prison population are estimated to have a serious mental illness. This is a diagnosable serious mental illness. We're talking about bipolar disorder, uh, 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 depression, clinical depression, the kind of depression that you can't get out of the, the, the bed for, schizophrenia, all manner of, of, of serious mental health 
issues and serious mental illnesses. Despite this, despite what we know, in 44 states, a jail or a prison hold more people with a diagnosed mental illness than the largest state hospital or psychiatric care facility in that state. Yales are the largest provider of mental health services in California, in New York, in Illinois, and in almost every state with a large population. But that's inside. That's on the inside. I'll make the argument that we also have to pay attention to what's on the outside. We have to pay attention to what's on the inside. We learned this through the COVID-19 pandemic, if for no other reason, if beyond compassionate grounds, humanitarian grounds, for the very reason that our fates are linked, that if they're sick, we're sick. But let's think about what happens on the outside. A point in time count tells us that there are 2 million people held in an American jail or prison on any given day. This is after a, a, a reduction uh, that started to happen around 2008. I'm sorry, two, I'm sorry, around 2000, um, around, around uh, yeah, around 2008, 2009. So, 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 so after modest reductions in the jail and prison population, uh, 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 there are 2 million people held in American jail or prison. And I, I need to apologize. The reductions happened around 2011, 2012. This happens along with California prison realignment. But there are 4.8 million people, between 4.6 and 4.8 million people on probation or parole on any given day. That's twice the size of the US prison population. And if you shift the unit of analysis from a point in time count to the number of people who pass through an institution, and even though that's not fair for the statisticians, <laughs> uh, it's necessary to make this point. So if you compare the number of people who are held in a place on the long term, either held on probation or parole, which usually lasts a few years, held in a prison, which lasts a few years to many decades, to think about the number of people in institution processes, we see the jails process nearly 10 million people a year. 10 million, figure five times the size of the prison. But even this figure, even this figure is eclipsed by the number of people with a felony record, which is estimated at 19.6 million people, and the number of people estimated to have a, cr a criminal record at all in this country, which is 80 million people. 80 million people have a criminal record. Not all of them have been arrested. Not all of them have gone to jail or prison. Among the felony, folks with felony convictions, 19 million people, just about all of them went to a jail or a prison. 20 million Americans have a felony record in this country. 80 million Americans have been touched by the criminal justice system and they all live in community. So what this tells me is that communities where the action is in the prison, despite its place in the public's imagination and its relative importance, especially when we think about things like hotspots for communicable disease, it's still just one tiny slice of a vast carceral landscape. And so this is a, a screenshot of the National Inventory of the Collateral Consequences of a Criminal Conviction. And what it does, it tells us the laws, policies, and sanctions that people are met with when they walk out the door. There are 44,000 of these, 44,000 laws, policies, and administrative sanctions that manage, that regulate the lives of all these people who pass through these institutions. But all politics are local. There are 1,500 in your state. Uh, this includes 954 uh, laws that limit the acquisition of, of, of employment by uh, other means. 87 that limit, limit political and civic participation. 63 that limit access to housing. 64 that tell them with whom they may live and under what circumstances that prevent them from getting houses, getting homes, finding and settling in apartments. Why is this so important? Why is this so important? Because everyone comes home. 95% of all prisoners will come home at some point. And with dozens and dozens of regulations on housing, dozens and dozens of, of restrictions that tell people where they may go and under what circumstances, we see that homelessness is, a, is, 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 is linked with incarceration in ways that have life-changing, life-altering, in fact, life-taking consequences. And so what I wanna do to illustrate this point, because at the end of the day, I'm actually a storyteller. You know, I've been talking about statistics today, but my work is really ethnographic. I'm, I'm a storyteller. I, I spend time with people. Uh, I go where they go. I try to do what they do. 
Um, and, I, and I wanna bring you with me so we can see what happens when people come home, especially the most vulnerable among us, especially people who suffer from these chronic illnesses that I talked about, from the mental health conditions that I may have mentioned. And I'll tell you a brief story that happened in Chicago. This starts in April and in the years, this is from some time ago, but, 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 but it's still resonant now. And this isn't a story in my book. This is a story that, that didn't quite make it uh, into the book that I wrote, but I certainly wanna share it with you because it brings this point home. At this point, the city of Chicago was in the midway or the midpoint of its 10 year plan to end homelessness. And this is just a few months before city officials admitted the depths of poverty in their own city. They renamed the 10 year plan because of this to just the plan. They realized that they weren't getting rid of homelessness in 10 years. This was the decade before private developers put up a fence around the triangle, evicting hundreds of homeless Chicagoans from their encampment on Lower Wacker Drive. I arrived at 4.30 a.m., surveyed the scene with my research partner and connected with a staff member from a homeless outreach organization. The staff member was kind and well-trained, a licensed clinical social worker. He had his clipboard in his hand and a duffel bag filled with extra socks, hats, gloves, petty cash, and $5 coupons good for a meal at McDonald's. This is when you could get a meal for $5 at McDonald's. <laughs> and there was a real need. A staggering 76,000 people experienced homelessness in Chicago a few years ago. The same number experienced homelessness in Chicago that year, but we didn't have the same kind of sophisticated counts. So in that year, the point in time count was around 7,000. We later learned it was 10 times that. The storm will come up in just a few hours. We waited with the social worker for the next arrival, a Chicago police officer. He seemed nice enough. Next, a garbage truck pulled up. My partner and I shadowed the social worker as he approached a man he knew from years of doing street outreach with kindness in his voice. He was a wonderful guy. He called the man by name and asked about his pending disability case before handing out his goods, a new pair of socks, the $5 coupon, a list of programs where the man could get services. The man shook his head, looked at the social worker, at us, then at the police officer. Finally, he looked at the garbage truck that hummed loudly just 10 feet away, picked up his bedroll and left. The client, I suppose, had been provided a service. We walked a few feet to the next client, the police officer accompanying our party with the garbage truck inching up as we offered our wares. Some encounters were much less friendly. One woman cursed the kind social worker saying, I know what you're doing. Another refused to leave after receiving socks and the McDonald's coupon, at which point the officer stepped to the front of our party and instructed the garbage man to throw away her bedroll. Sometimes the officer led the interaction. Some people had shopping carts or radios or small chairs, things that violated a new city ordinance that had just passed against camping in public. This was a part of a wave of legislation that social scientists call the criminalization of homelessness and the criminalization of poverty. The officer and the garbage man threw their things away. The routine by now was clear, accept services and clear the area or have your things tossed or be arrested. Either way, you will be forced to be removed. The hum of the garbage truck reminding you of the stakes and the police officer ensuring your compliance. In the years to come, I will follow outreach workers to bus stops, to tent cities, and to ride the trains at night. Almost everyone we met had a pending court case for a drug use or for trafficking. All of them had criminal records for petty larceny, for public urination, for trespassing, for the kinds of things you have to do when you sleep on the street. This was a part of an era of crime control we've come to associate with broken windows policing, where men with squeegees were seen as a threat to public safety. And like the first client and every other client we encountered during my time shadowing outreach workers that summer, almost all of them had a diagnosable disability and almost all of them applied for disability insurance. But almost without fail, their disability claims were denied. It didn't matter if it was the man who was paralyzed from his waist down after being shot during a robbery. He was a truck driver, by the way, no longer able to support himself. His claim was denied because he hadn't been disabled for two full years, so said the Social Security Administration. Or if it was the women I met who lived in that tent city. People needed support. Over half of the people who resided in the American jail or prison, the people who had been arrested constantly through these legislative changes, 
lived on incomes at or below half the US poverty line, which is to say they were all poor. One study found that over half of jail residents reported no taxable income in the three years prior to their sentence. What I didn't know then was that people who experienced a bout of street homelessness, all the people I followed, were seven times more likely to be arrested than members of the general population. And conversely, people who were incarcerated were more, uh, more than once were 13 times more likely to experience homelessness. While I had some idea that, uh, that, that illness and incarceration were clustered, I didn't know the extent. The evidence is now clear. Jails and prisons make us sick. Studies show that people who are incarcerated report worse health than they reported in the year before that they went in. And with one study estimating that for every year someone spends in a state penitentiary, they lose two years off their life course. Meaning every year you stay in a prison, you lose two years of life expectancy. But while mass incarceration has produced what we might term a set of disabling social conditions, all these laws and policies that prevent people from getting, among other things, homes, I didn't know how to make sense of how disability was experienced in the shadow of mass incarceration. So many people encountered, uh, we encountered had, this, had diagnosable disabilities, and so many of the disability claims were rejected that the outreach organization had to employ a full-time lawyer to challenge disability denials. One couple I interviewed lived in a tent city of 22nd and Halstead Street. The woman would light their tent on fire at night. Her partner asked the outreach worker for help because each night she would hear voices and set the tent on fire. But what could he do? You know what I learned? The woman didn't get help. Her disability claim, once they eventually filled it out, found a doctor to help them fill it out, found multiple social workers to help them make the appointments, appointments to finish filling out the paperwork. Her disability claim was denied. She hadn't been sick long enough or her condition of pyromania, of schizophrenia likely, wasn't good enough to qualify for the benefit. But you know what happened to her? She was arrested for arson. This is the landscape. We've criminalized poverty in our country. Prisons make us sick. Rejection makes us sick. There's a wonderful set of studies by Geraldine Downey, an eminent psychologist who works at Columbia University. She writes about rejection sensitivity. And what she finds is that when people hear no constantly, no in part stirred by the policy regime that they encounter, where 45,000 laws, policies, and sanctions tell you you can't rent an apartment, you can't get a job, you can't spend time with your family. After encountering so many no's, you develop what she calls anticipatory rejection. In children, it leads to poor performance in school and behavioral problems. In adults, it leads to depression and dissatisfaction in one's relationships. Prison makes us sick. The policy apparatus we've erected make us sick. And we don't have an avenue for help because we constantly and consistently deny the claims for help when people finally find ways to make them. So what can be done? I think we have to think carefully about who we elect. I don't think the people in office right now are paying careful attention to problems like this. I think we need communication campaigns that tell new narratives about the experiences of formerly incarcerated people and incarcerated people in our American jails and prisons. I think we have to think carefully about the people we throw away for a million reasons. I also think we have to follow the lead of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. There's a wonderful organization called All of Us Are None right in California. All of us and none. Nothing for us without us is a slogan from another organization. I think we need the leadership of people with criminal records to help us find a way out of this thing. Because honestly, I don't think most of us know much about the experiences of having a criminal record at all. I think above all, we have to advocate for the health and well being of people with criminal records. We have to remember that they're not just dangerous people, right? Like we see them as the danger, we're afraid of them. But these people, People who we arrest are the most vulnerable among us, the least among us. They need help. 
They need our help for their well-being and for our good as a community, as a society. I think we're staring at the face of a new ethical question. This is what we've done. We've erected a society that criminalizes the poor, that arrests our most vulnerable, especially the vulnerable and mentally ill. One study showed that over half of the people who were killed during police encounters, those unarmed, largely people of color, but not exclusively, who were killed by police during a police stop, that half of them had a diagnosed mental illness. We don't know how to tolerate difference very well. We live in a society that throws the other away. But the question for us is what kind of society do we want? And that's the question I'll leave you with. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. We really appreciate yet another nice uh, wrap up of uh, this social justice speaker series, but also more importantly, uh, bringing all the pieces together with regard to criminal justice and the impact on mental health and how they are uh, linked and uh, almost woven together and how we must address each part, both with disability and mental health, uh, if we are to really um, solve our country's problem. And this is our country's problem. So now uh, we'd like to uh, begin by asking a few questions and then we'll uh, turn it over to our students to also probe and ask questions. Uh, and they have, by the way, read your book. Each oh, of them great, all right. <laughs> uh, and so um, I think our, our second years read your book and so uh, they should, should be well-versed. So go ahead and let Dr. Cummings begin. Yes, uh, yeah, riveting as expected. And uh, so excited again to kind of hear you weave these pieces together for us. Um, uh, and just one, you know, one comment that it was actually going to be one of my questions um, is that really loved in your book the way you kind of weave together sort of poetry and these parables. Um, and sort of constructing from the traditions of, 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 of the Black church specifically and music that used to lift up a lot of these concepts around um, rejection. So I'm so glad you got it, that you were able to kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, how, how did you come to think about rejection as sort of the context? Because I think it's a really interesting, you know, commentary, you know, on this moral question that you raise. Oh, I appreciate that question so much. It's so the, the you know, in, in the book, and, and I know second years have read it, there might be some people on, on, on the call who haven't, but in, in, in the book, um, I, I try to wrestle with what it means to care for my brother who was incarcerated, who was locked up, um, while I'm following families who are caring for their brother. And so this wasn't how things were going to go down. And this is going to get to the to, to why rejection, um, but this this wasn't how things were going to go down at first. At first, I was just going to write about my studies, and and you know I I I, I kind of write the same, but but the the the, the closeness that thinking about my brother's incarceration um, uh, afforded me was was insight into uh, a set of experiences that I may not have had had I sort of distanced myself from it, um, and so some things became true. I was interviewing people who, not just my brother, but people who I had met many years ago that, that, that I met in, in, in my life and practice. So I was a volunteer chaplain when, when I started this work in uh, 2003. I did that for about five years. I was working in the Cook County Jail. And uh, one of the brothers in the book, a brother I call Martin, you know, I use pseudonyms mostly in the book, um, I met him uh, before that at a church service and then saw him show up in, in chapel. And this was all a part of this idea of letting in things that are close. Martin and I are very close with, that's my dear friend. I've known him now for you know 20 years or more. Um, I interviewed him probably over the course of about 13 of those years, uh, but he wasn't gonna be in the book at first. He wasn't gonna be in the book because I thought he was too close to me. But to explain what happened, uh, when I decided to be honest with the fact that um, 
if my model was right, if the social scientific model that I thought I designed to do this study was right, I would have been in the model. I was born poor and black after 1972 when mass incarceration begins. This chart that I put up is the first slide or the second. Um, okay, so now I'm in the model. That means my brother's in the model. Okay, I'm in the model. I'm doing practice work that should be disconnected from my life, but people who I know keep showing up in the jail where I'm working. Right? So, and so my dear friend Martin shows up in the jail where I'm working. So now Martin's in the study. Well, I know Martin for many, many years. I followed him for 13 years. So eventually I asked him a question about some data that I collected that I got wrong, that I got wrong. It was about, he talked to me about a cycle of abuse that he experienced, which I write about in the book. And uh, I thought, well, he needed help. And I asked him why he didn't ask the people at his church. I knew them very well. Why didn't you ask them? And I thought he told me um, because his mother was a mother in the church and he didn't want to embarrass her. That's what I thought he said to me. He tells me he didn't say that to me. What he said was that she said that they would hold it over his head, that they would always remind him of the person that he was, that everywhere he turned, he'd get that reminder of who you were and who you'd be. So two things in this moment. One, the correction. <laughs> the long-term relationship allows for me to get things right. You know, the, the correction. Yo, I was about to go way off in the left field, write some analysis about like this strange relationship, but, like the whole nine, I was completely wrong. Two, he told me that everywhere he turned, people would, would hold his record against him. And they would use that as a reason to treat him poorly. They'd use it, that as a reason to reject him and reject his, the, 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 his requests for things that he needed. And then we started talking about what it meant to live with rejection, what it meant to live under this weight of rejection. And so this was sort of the, how that concept came. It definitely was through what we would call the data. But the data is only there if I didn't allow someone very close to me into the study, which is usually not allowed, which is why I went through this long, <laughs> no, so, so, so why, like how and why like music and poetry and like all this stuff. Um, uh, you know, I, as you mentioned, like I come out of a, a, a black tradition that believes in the liberation of people because black people have been oppressed. And, and so, so I come out of a black liberatory um, tradition. And in that tradition, all things sort of count. I mean you know, the, the, you, you don't just do social theory with, you know, the, you know, the famous social theorists, you don't just do the social, you know, you don't do social theory with, with, the, with the big wigs, with Rawls or Marx or, or Weber or Durkheim or something like that. Um, you know, James Baldwin's a social theorist, Nina Simone's a social theorist, Robert Glasper's a social theorist, Kamazi Washington's a social theorist, and Martin's a social theorist. He gave me a theory of rejection. So then when I take Martin's theory of rejection, and I hold it up to Geraldine Downey, Professor Downey's theory of rejection, it holds, it, it, they correspond, they make sense. And so, and so that's how and why um, sort of the, 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 the book feels the way it feels, feels the way it feels, it, it's how the book took the form that it took. Yeah, thank you so much. Cause uh, you know, as you read it, it you're, you're really a beautiful storyteller and I can hear the songs, you know, as I'm reading through this very, you know, a critical uh, piece of data and information, but I can hear the music in the background of Nina Simone as I as I read through. So no, thank you for that really important kind of distinction and understanding, sort of taking home that message of, you know, it's the impacted populations that really have to help us understand, you know, what's happening, so. Oh, I appreciate that. That that that. Thank you for your brilliant analysis. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's exactly like that. You know, the, the thing you hope, like you don't know that you're hoping that that's the thing that comes. Like I, I had no idea to hope that that would come across in that way. And so now I'm gonna take that with me. I'm gonna write that down somewhere. <laughs> I'm gonna take that with me. <laughs> Really, uh, like to. That's a great segue into one of the questions that I I, I wanted to ask or uh, for you to probe a little further, um, because it it did have a profound impact on me when you made the statement that those that were impacted are the ones that are going to actually guide us through um, yeah. and navigate the solutions. And um, I think as public health practitioners, we don't you know we talk about involving our community participatory research. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I believe that it, it has its limits based on our biases as researchers, right? Uh, so, and in, in, in having uh, formerly incarcerated actually lead us through this maze, when, and I really see it as a, a maze that uh, where homelessness and mental health and disabilities are all woven in together and you don't know what came for first. Um, and I think that uh, it's going to be really important to have, uh, have those that are impacted navigate uh, us through this problem in, in, in this country. But I'd like to just probe that a little further and ask you what kinds of ways, what suggestions would you have um, you know, for uh, of those of us that are practicing and then of uh, clinicians, how can we um, set it up to where we can follow the lead of those who um, are experiencing homelessness, mental illness, and incarceration, or those loved ones that are experiencing it? How can we set up processes where they can actually lead us through to find solutions? Yeah, I appreciate that question so much. Uh, and especially with the population that we're talking about today, you know, a group that, I mean, you know, the women who we who we talked about today, you know, is, is hearing voices and setting fires and, you know, so, you know, can she, for example, you know, is she the person to, to lead us to a brighter future? And so on, 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 one, on some levels, yes, of course, like her experiences are helping us to understand um, her requests, uh, when and if she makes them, her resistance, you know, um, help us to understand. Um, but there are also people who are vulnerable uh, because of what we've done through law and policy. This is this is the this is one of the I think really important um, points. You know, I don't know that everybody has the, the capacity to lead. So I'll give you an example. Like me, I'm I'm not um, uh, the most detail oriented guy. It's not my thing. I mean, you know, my social science, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm rigorous in my methods and stuff like that, but I'm, I'm kind of a solo show. I'm not a manager. Like there, there, there are things that, that, um, that I'm not good at um, and that I would be bad at. So I'd be a bad politician. I'd be a bad CEO. You know, this is just, this is my own personality. This is, it doesn't mean, you know, and I'm not fishing for compliments. I think I'm good at what I do, right? Like, like but I don't do that. You know, you know what I mean? Like I don't run programs. I, I don't do that. Um, and there are people who are really good at those things. And there are people who have real deep skill sets um, uh, in leadership, in uh, that they have deep understandings of how organizations run, that have deep understandings of people, uh, and, 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 and they're different and the different ways to be in leadership. Uh, and some people need uh, help to b bring those capacities out. So some people have never had the chance, for example, to run an organization that's not a street organization. And, and some people have never had the chance uh, to, to, to use their people watching skills to help uh, think through, for example, the needs of coworkers or co-laborers in, in a particular endeavor. And so the work that I would do would be to align with organizations that help prop up leaders, formerly incarcerated leaders. There, there, there are a bunch um, across the country that do that work. And there are a bunch of formerly incarcerated leaders who are incredible leaders who, who have things like policy shops. And they can, so I'm thinking about Susan Burden from A New Way of Life in LA. I'm thinking about you know, All of Us and None, shop run largely by a guy named uh, Dorsey Nunn, but not just him, I mean, he's got a whole network of like, so many people who do that. I'm thinking about uh, the folks that, that, that um, you know, Professor Cummings and, and Professor Kelly you know, both connect with in the exoneration um, workshops. I'm thinking about uh, meeting people where they are, helping to enhance uh, the skill sets that people have, giving people the opportunity to grow because they're people. So the difference between someone who's been locked up, and of course, you know this, of course, like I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm just riffing on the question, but the difference between somebody who's been locked up and somebody who hasn't is they haven't been locked up. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's the big difference. The difference between somebody with a, a criminal record, I mean, aside from doing the thing that got them locked up, most people are, quote, guilty, right? Like most people have done the crime. That's not, but that's, that's, that we're, we're having a, we're, the discussion is, is, is moving in a different direction, which is 
Um, the difference between me and, and my brother who was locked away, the difference between me and, and the brothers who were locked away is I've had a set of opportunities that look very different. I've also made a set of choices. So now I want you to fully participate in, in, in society, but I don't allow you to, 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 to make any choices. I don't allow you to have any leadership. I don't allow you room to move and breathe and be a fully human participant in the human community, including bring to bear your gifts, the, the things that, that you're really good at. So I'm really bad at leadership. What do I look like speaking for people with records? What do I look like making decisions about the things that they need? That's not the role that I play. I'm a researcher. I'm a thing I, I speak to and all these things, but you know, I've, I've, you know, I have a set of skills. My job is to use my skills. Uh, uh, I use the capacity that I have to, 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 to the fullest is, is how I see you know, my role in the world and allowing others to do the same, but we, but the, the place where we don't see uh, people with records enough is in leadership. We'll let them have a job at McDonald's, but we won't let them run, for example, the organization. So what I would do is I would collaborate. I would partner with organizations that do this important work. Um, you know, uh, Glenn Martin, who started Just Leadership USA, uh, says a couple things. So one is the slogan, Just Leadership's USA slogan uh, that I think he coined, which was, you know, those close to the problem or close to the solution, but furthest from the resources, the other half of that, which is just the super important half of that. Um, and there's another thing uh, that, 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 uh, uh, that he often says, which is, you know, no social movement um, was led, well, you, you're hard pressed to find a, a successful social movement that's been led by people who haven't had direct experience with the problem. So the civil rights movement was led by black people. The, the, the GLBTQ rights movement, the ongoing movement is, is led by GLBTQ people. You know, the landless people movement in Brazil, the, the, right, like the, 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 the welfare mother strikes, the bread strikes, the, you know, the, the, the unionist movements, all these movements are led by people who have direct experience in the thing that they're trying to push for. Uh, the place where we don't allow that to happen is with people with criminal records because we're afraid of them, because we're afraid of them. And so, and so, and so we have to drop some of our fears to allow for people to operate in their full capacity is, 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 what, I, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and some people aren't gonna be good at it. So you, so you can't put the woman, you know, and I, I think, I think someone who's in need of deep help, who doesn't have a skill set to say running, you can't put them at the top of the organization because they've got a criminal record. That's, that's the other side of fear. That's the other side of stereotype. You know, oh, you're magic because you've had the experience. No, I'm magic because I'm magic, right? Like put the magic guy, woman, uh, in the position to work their magic because they've got magic, not because of, of, of where they were born, the color of their skin, you know, these, these, like all, these, all these sorts of things. That's what I think. I, I appreciate that. And I, I, you know, I think you make some really valid points with regards to, you know, kind of the limitations, but then actually just the partner, the partnerships that uh, partnering with organizations and, and people um, that have those experiences. And as we move forward, Gail, you had some other questions. I do have some other questions. I'm I am mindful of the time, and I do want to allow uh, maybe some some of our guests to ask questions, um, and then I can I can save mine. Um, so let's uh, allow our guests to uh, populate the Q and A uh, uh, feature in the webinar with their questions. We do have one question uh, and a comment, a thank you um, from uh, Keelan Thomas. Uh, who has read about the Miami-Dade and Bexar County models, um, but wanted to know if you have come across uh, any mental health incarceration diversion models that have been effective at reducing the number of people with mental health disorders in jails and prisons. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a, um, uh, is it, is it called city model? I mean, it, there, there, uh, there, there are a million, and I think all of them um, do interesting and important work. Uh, I, I, I don't have one that I think is, you know, say the best, the, 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 the best way to accomplish this, but I think diversion programs broadly um, are, 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 re are really good things. Mental health response teams 
um, for example, um, can be really useful and important. Um, uh, the deployment of people with clinical training uh, to, to, to address the needs of people with uh, mental health issues instead of, say, for example, police. Um, so, so, so not just training a police officer in, in, in you know, appropriate response to mental health, which is, I think that all police should probably get that sort of training. So when they come across a problem, they know to call, they know, to, uh, you know, they know how to respond to it. Um, but I think that police are probably not the right people to respond to a mental health crisis. And so all the, all the rapid response models that deploy someone else, someone without a gun, for example, um, to help diffuse uh, a, a situation of a mental health crisis. Like these are things that I think um, are really useful, necessary, um, and, and I think useful and necessary. I think, I think there are evaluations that show that they're also effective. Well, yeah, um, and I know uh, there probably will be some other questions, but I, I'm going to jump in right now <laughs> and ask mine while we wait. Uh, so uh, you, you talk a little bit about sort of this complicated irony. You, you say it a little bit differently, but this complication and this I irony of policing, particularly in uh, poor Black communities, um, there's, there's a quote. You say, this too is the afterlife of slavery. Um, that is to say that the afterlife of mass incarceration, you're over police and, 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 and underprotected. The police don't come when you call them. Um, they only come when you're being arrested. So, I mean, you touched on this a little bit, but can you talk or give some examples about how this paradox really does imp impact the mental health of, of the communities um, that are being over policed? It's not just that individual like you talk about. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, one example that's, that's, that's not in the book um, to think about how policing shapes sort of the social lives of, of, of uh, Black people specifically um, in a city like Chicago, but every other city. I mean, you know, name, your, name your city and, and, and you'll see the same thing. But we had an infamous um, torture ring that was run by uh, the police and I, you know I'm not being hyperbolic. I mean it was it was a torture ring. It was a John, John, run by John Burge and 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 in a group called the Midnight Crew. And, and and every major city has some version of this, but this this was especially egregious. They had um, tortured uh, 200 at least, um, mostly men. I think all, all men uh, in the city and and to, and and got got them to falsely confess to crimes that they didn't do. Well, anyway, this was a part of a larger, um, and, and, and there's a whole discussion about what policing, what torture techniques birds use. I mean, it's pretty grim. He, you know, learned torture techniques in Vietnam and deployed them, and and you know, on on in, on the south and west sides of Chicago with members of the Midnight Crew. Many, many dozens and dozens of people have had their convictions reversed in, in response to this, you know, this kind of thing. But I was talking to one of the survivors of, of, of members of the Midnight Crew in, in the torture ring whose case is working through the courts now. It takes years and years and years for these things to get resolved. And he would tell me about just the standard policing interactions that he had when he was a kid. And so when he's a kid, police started off by just roughing the kids up, just, you know, not like beating them up, but just, you know, handling them, you know? And then they start putting them in their cars. So that's 10, 11 years old. They do that if the kids were standing together. And this was during the late 80s. You just handle them, and tell, you know, curse them out, sometimes joke with them, whatever. But, but they had this overwhelming presence uh, it, for these children, ostensibly babies. Uh, and then that turned into as they got a little older. So now they're 12 or 13, so now they're getting put in the car. 13, 14, they start driving that car and dropping the kids off in different neighborhoods throughout the city, one of which was a neighborhood called Bridgeport, which was known as an incredibly racist neighborhood right outside of um, the, the a deeply uh, segregated Black neighborhood. And so the kids from Bridgeport, um, I, I, I didn't live very close to Bridgeport. My brother and I would walk across the street sometimes because there's a Sox Park. And anyway, there's this interesting dividing line. And, um, and the kids would throw rocks and stuff like that. Anyway, these kids would get dropped off in the middle of Bridgeport 
and they'd have to run home, run home for their lives, literally for their lives, <laughs> run home. In fact, one kid uh, didn't make it. Uh, his name was Leonard Clark. There was a famous uh, story about an incident that happened with him. He was beaten uh, almost to death uh, and, 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 and is disabled. Um, as a, as a result of this. So how does that show up in the everyday social life for these children? So then what happens when kids see police? They run, <laughs> they run, <laughs> they, 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 they shoot off, they take off running. They make a game out of running. The game is, ah, oh, there's a cop, bounce, you know, right? Like that, that's the game. So the children are growing up in the shadow of policing, in the shadow of policing where if they don't run, so, so they don't know, uh, on some level, the kids don't know why they're running. On another level, what they don't know is if they don't run, they could get dropped off in Bridgeport. And this fuels a kind of distrust for authority, for adults, for teachers, right? Uh, it fuels a kind of paranoia, right? So, so, so we, see, we, see, we, see, we see the ripple effects of, of, of this heinous, egregious, abuses, everyday abuses of power. And so uh, scholars who study this tell us that what that does, on the one hand, is sort of health and mental health effects of that. So anytime there's like a police beating, for example, um, uh, community mental health takes a hit. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, 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 work, work from, from uh, brilliant so, uh, sociologists thinking about one social, social, social science out of, sociologist out of uh, Emory University um, who, who writes this incredible book on sort of the mental health effects of police stops, the mental health effects of police abuse. Um, and so on the one hand, there's, there's, there's that side of it. On the other hand, uh, the political scientists have studied this phenomenon and say it teaches people, people about their place uh, in, in, in the civic life of their country. And so civic participation begins to go down. So not only does it have a health and mental health effect, it has a civic effect. It, it, it dampens civic participation, making it less likely that people will work to, for example, change the systems that, 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 that hem them in. And so anyway, uh, 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 police abuse, for example, uh, over-policing and under-protection. The other thing is response times. In the city of Detroit, when I was doing research in Detroit, 2013, 2014, the response time uh, for an active shooter, for police to respond to an active shooter in the city of Detroit was 50 minutes, 50 minutes. What does that tell you? What does that teach you? What does that, what does that, what does that do to how you feel about, how you, how you feel about yourself and your place in the world? It, 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 it has manifold effects uh, in those ways. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I mean, that just kind of uh, kind of points to some of the work that we're doing in Vallejo. We're sort of just at the very early stages of, of looking at how that those exposures um, sort of impact the the daily and just mental health well being of, of communities as a, as a whole. Not 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 specifically individuals that were you know abused or or um, Im impacted directly, but having that you know understanding of what happens when you might be uh, impacted and how that impact affects you on a, on a regular basis so yeah when we think about when we think about health disparities it's interesting it's like it's like some of the stuff is is, is well figured out so we know you know um, for example um, the impact of, of of racism on things like infant mortality you know we know that um, you know uh, uh, infant mortality and 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 systemic and structural racism. You know, there, there's there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting relationship between that. But but what's in what's balled up in the systemic and structural racism is 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 the question. You know, and so and so some of this stuff we can we can see. You know, you can see um, depressive symptoms as it relates to the incarceration of a mother, and we know that the incarceration of a mother or a parent leads to you know, X amount of depression in children or something like that. Like that, that stuff has been calculated and, and you know, people have thought through that. Um, but these effects are equally powerful and they kind of linger and they don't, they're not well suited for the kind of empirical calculations that we're looking for, you know? So for example, what does it mean to be a kid to grow up in the neighborhood 
where the Midnight Crew does their thing. You know, Jason Lee actually has a question too. Uh, he says, are there any books that you would recommend to cover issues like the Midnight Crew? This is in the chat. And, um, and then, sorry, to jump, I just saw it. I wanted to address it while we're talking about it. Um, I, would, I would suggest reading a wonderful book called The Torture Letters by Lawrence Ralph. The Torture Letters by Lawrence Ralph. And he, 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 it, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's, it's written as letters to different people, to survivors of torture, to the police who looked the other way when, <laughs> when torture was happening, uh, uh, to, 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 to children who are growing up and who see torture uh, sort of in their communities. It's, it's a beautifully written, really powerful um, book. Uh, and he's an anthropologist, so he studies culture and you know how 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 these sort of things shape culture. Uh, but but these these lingering effects of these kinds of moves um, are really powerful and important to think about. Everything isn't yet measurable. Like we don't yet know how to measure everything, and you can you can calculate error, of course. But 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 it doesn't quite get at some of this stuff we're talking about, like how you understand your role. In a given society, that's not, that's not it's not given to a kind of quantitative measure. It's more like talk to me about how you feel about yourself in relation to this this abuse that you that you've witnessed. It's more it's more on on a relational um, sort of terms that, that that we see these impacts. Yeah, no, that's so important because it makes you think about that. You know, the, that ACEs scale. How do you how do you put that in there? It, well, it's not in there anyway because I don't. It's not a part of it. But even it would it should be and how do you measure that how do you kind of quantify that like you say i think that's one of a one of the big challenges that we're all kind of trying to figure out but i think you point to it is you have to talk to people and you have to go where they go and be a part of their lives and that really does bring you closer um to helping you know helping design those those strategies and solutions Deirdre is putting the name of that book in the chat. Looks like uh, your student, Raina, has a comment. Oh, hey, Raina. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Raina is always providing great insight. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for um, assisting us in finding the book. Um, you know, I, I really wanted to talk about or uh, ask you about and, and have you um, talk about what's currently being done. So when you came and spoke in previous sessions, you know, you, you really laid it out. Uh, and I think uh, in a lot of ways, the book is almost, uh, for lack of a, 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 a better term, a, a bookend. Um, you know, for many of the talks that you gave that provided all the statistics, right? The statistics on policing, the various uh, laws that um, are different from state to state, county to county, city to city. I mean, it was so much uh, that, you know, I had no idea that this was there. And so for us to actually tackle such an immense social and political problem, uh, I'm wondering what kinds of over um, yeah, kind of larger, broad-based federal policies could we put in place to actually uh, begin to chip at this social and political problem that uh, is really underlying so much of uh, the problems that we're having. You know, I, I, I really don't believe that you can handle or you can take care of homelessness without tackling the incarceration problem. Um, and I don't think that you can, you know, handle homelessness without tackling how we address mental health and actually the imprisonment of individuals with mental health issues, right? Uh, and so, and, and I also don't think that we can tackle this problem uh, on a county to county, city to city basis. And I think that's probably uh, part of, of, of what's going on. Um, we, we are as kind of individuals, as communities trying to handle a um, much larger um, a problem uh, that needs a, a larger solution. So how, how do you think we should begin to kind of chip away at, at this political and social problem? You know, I think uh, housing really matters. I mean, I, okay, so, so let me say, I think that the problem isn't, um, you're not suggesting this, but I just, wanna, I just wanna make this point, like I just wanna make a point based on the question, not something that you suggested. Um, 
uh, one way to interpret this would be to look for, say, here's the policy mechanism that has the most leverage. And I think there are some of those for sure. You know, like here's, here's a deep leverage point. And so I would, I would make the case that housing really matters. You know, like, you know, like I, I would make that case, uh, you know, if I were to do that. But let me, before we go there, let me first say um, that the, the, the biggest problem is, 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 is how we think about the problem itself. Like the, the biggest problem is, is, is um, our, our, our need, our, our fear of people with criminal records and our need for a feeling of safety and, our, and the way we glory in retribution. This is a this is a giant problem, uh, and so because we're afraid of people with criminal records, we write laws to exclude them, to keep them away from us. So we exclude them from labor, so we can't get jobs. We exclude them from housing, so they can't find a place to live. We exclude them from civic life because we don't want them to run things because we're afraid of them. Which is the point about bringing in people with records, you know, leadership, you know, this kind of thing really matters. I think so civically, especially this is a very civically active group of people, by the way. Um, you know, we're 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 afraid um, to allow them to run businesses. <laughs> we want to punish them so we don't let them. So they're the good character clauses for everything, from getting you know selling real estate to grooming dogs in some states to you know getting a barber's license, etc. So we write all these laws out of fear because we're afraid of their propensity for violence and and and, and the likelihood that they'll engage in crime. The problem is any criminologist worth their salt will tell you that precarity leads to violence and crime. So what we do is we write them out of employment. Unemployment is linked to increased rates of violence and crime. We, we don't want to let them have a place to stay. We don't live by us. So we make it so that they can't find a place to stay. And housing instability is positively related to violence and crime. You know, like so. So what we've done is we've written through our social policy a more we we've produced a more violent world through our law, in the name of protecting us from violence. This is this is this is the cycle. This is the cycle that we're in. So so we've got to break that cycle. That's 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 the 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 the, the not the first part because everybody's not going to get there right away. But it's 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 like a key central sort of move where we view people with criminal records as fully human participants in a human community, which means we ask questions that we'd ask of ourselves. What do I need to thrive? And therefore, what do they need to thrive? That, so that, all right, but, but to answer your question directly about places where there's more leverage than others, I think there are things that would make a real big difference right away. For example, if HUD dropped um, their guideline on if they drop the, the felony restrictions out of their housing guidelines. And they're right now wrestling with that question. Um, they're, 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 they're wrestling with the idea of fair housing. And they're thinking right now, literally now, like this year, um, they are thinking about um, how people with criminal records might fit into uh, their, 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 their fair housing, their, their calculus around what fair housing is. And so pushing HUD, you know, to the extent that we have influence in those arenas uh, to allow people with criminal records uh, to, to, to stay in public housing changes a whole lot. I mean, the housing restrictions started in public housing, starts in 1987 with the, um, with the, with the, the Drug Abuse Act of 1987. And this is the first place where we see um, housing restrictions for people with felony records, at least the first place that I found, housing restrictions for people with felony records sort of written into policy. And it gets exacerbated in 1996 and when the Clinton administration announces what they call the one strike rule, where they say, if you've ever committed a crime, one strike and you're out, no matter when you committed it, one strike and you're out. And if you allow somebody to so much as visit your home who's ever committed a crime, then we will evict you too. So we start to see evictions double, they increase dramatically in the first six months of the country. So, so like getting housing right um, really matters. Sending the signal, so the president at a State of the Union address, in one case, it's President Clinton, did the, the announcement of the one strike rule and evictions uh, increased and the number of rejections of housing applications doubled within six months of his address. So we see this work in a bad way. <laughs> like this, is, this is how it works in a bad way. Uh, perhaps it can work in a good way. So on the one hand, deal with the guideline. On the other hand, promote it. Promote it. So that's housing. The other thing I think that really matters 
is the is, is allowing uh, is the idea of being tried like the, the idea of being tried by a jury of one's peers um, in most states over thirty uh, having a, a a felony conviction bars you from being able to sit on a jury, which means every time somebody with a criminal record comes before a court, they're never tried by somebody who's who's been in their shoes. So when they say, you know what, you're trying to get me on habituation, meaning you're trying to say that. Um, I did something before, and that's related directly to this thing. Well, they're not allowing this in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, by the way. Things that he said in the past aren't, aren't would not letting that come up. That's a different conversation for another day. Uh, but 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 habituation is used uh, in in different ways against poor people, against poor Black people, against poor people who identify as Latino or Latino or, La or Latinx against 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 indigenous people all the time they say look you've been arrested uh many times that arrest is evidence of your criminality here you are being arrested again even if the thing is unrelated you know and so and so the person with the criminal record might say that was me a decade ago i'm a different person that person is dead and gone the jury may be sympathetic but has no understanding from their body of what that is and what that means you know and, and 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 so and so it, it and so when the, when when they say guilty, we find you guilty. Uh, they're not finding themselves guilty. There's a disconnect. There's, there's there's a there's a disconnect that we can intervene in, and I think allowing people uh, access to jury duty really matters. But those are things that are, that are near and dear to my heart. I think civic participation and jury duty is a giant way to civically engage um, is a big deal, and I think that housing um, really really matters. The last thing that I think. Um, that would make a giant deal is kind of thing that we could set as federal policy is the automatic expungement of juvenile records. I can't tell you how many times we see um, things that people did when they were 15 and 16 years old haunt them uh, when, they're, when, they're, when they're 20, 30, 40 years old. Those records keep circulating. And even though they're supposed to happen in a separate court, it doesn't matter. Like they, the judge still has access to it. And so, and, and the prosecutor will still bring it up. You know, this is a troubled person. He has been forever, look at this. Um, and so, so these are things that that I think are powerful, interesting, and and points of real leverage. But there are others. There, 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 there are many others, and, and and there are many advocates across the country that are doing work. If people are interested, I would connect with some of those organizations that are working locally. I would definitely get down with them. So much. I really appreciate your your insight, uh, and and it gives our students something to kind of go on what they can, um, what they can do personally, if nothing else. Uh, you know, kind of how we can as individuals cast our votes uh, when iterations of these policies come up. How to shoot the ones down that don't, uh, for lack of a better term, um, that don't actually support um, a just system. And so again, you give, you've given us much to think about and our students um, a very different perspective, our clinical students, uh, a perspective on who they will meet day to day and uh, how they should approach or think about the people that they encounter uh, uh, daily, uh, to not fear them, um, but to have respect for all human uh, life and uh, perspectives and value and contribution. So again, we are honored to have invited you and, and to have you here. And we really look forward to your next book. Uh, we look forward to uh, um, all of the research opportunities uh, that you, you bring our way as well. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Thank you, it's, it's, it's been my great pleasure. I, 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 I would like to say federal policy matters, local policy also really matters. Let's think about people all the way down the ballot, judges, commissioners, folks in your ward, definitely mayors, definitely attorneys, definitely judges, uh, district attorneys, et cetera. These things really, really matter and they can make a giant difference in the lives of people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone, I've uh, posted the uh, information in the chat. Once again, I believe there was a request for continuing medical education. Uh, I'd also like to thank you all for participating this year in the Toro University Social Justice Speaker Series. Uh, we are here every fall uh, bringing you uh, new topics uh, on social justice to both our clinical students, our public health students, and uh, the community at large. So thank you again.
Have a nice evening.